So welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining. Uh, one more reminder, just make sure to remain muted. We've got a lot of people in the room um, and go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat box. Um, again, we're gonna be recording the session and it'll go up on the YouTube channel for Heart of the Civil War Heritage Area. Um, and I'll include that link in a follow-up email as well. Uh, we hope that this presentation and the discussion and Q&A at the end is gonna clock in at about an hour. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, and I'd like to first introduce our presenters and thank them for their time and agreeing to participate in this webinar. Uh, first up, we have Christina Claussen. She is the Marketing and Public Relations Manager at the Watcom Museum in Bellingham, Washington, where she manages publicity, social and digital media, graphic design, and advertising. Um, and then we're gonna talk to Matthew Webb. He's the Executive Director of the Konikajig Institute near Mercersburg, Pennsylvania. The Konikajig Institute is a historic house museum on 30 acres, it has a focus on hands-on learning about 18th century life in the region. Um, and then we'll hear from Jake Quinn. He's the Director of Interpretation at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick, Maryland. The museum has three sites. Um, they have one in downtown Frederick. Uh, they also have a house on Antietam National Battlefield, the Pry House Field Hospital Museum, um, as well as the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office in Washington, DC. Um, Jake now spends most of his time that is spent on site at the DC Museum, the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office. So thanks to the three of them for agreeing to um, have this conversation today. So I guess first we'll turn it to you, Christina. Um, you can go ahead and unmute. Thanks, Emily, and welcome everyone. So glad to be here. Um, I'm Christina Klassen, as Emily said, the marketing and PR manager at the Watcom Museum, which is in Washington State in Bellingham, Washington. So um, we're representing from the West Coast, but I know many of you are in the East Coast region and maybe some from the Midwest as well. Um, so welcome. I'm gonna do a quick screen share. So just bear with me for a moment. Okay, is everyone seeing my intro slide? Yes, okay, very good. Um, so this is, we are, um, the Watka Museum has been a museum for about uh, more than 77 years now, I think. Um, and we are a multidisciplinary museum. We are art, history, natural history, and children's education. Um, we have a three building campus, but I'm just showing our two main campuses because there are two main buildings um, because one of our buildings mostly houses photo archives and offices and it isn't really open to the public but we have um, on the left the light catcher building which was built in 2009 and it is a silver lead certified building with our fine art galleries museum store cafe space and a children's museum that we call the family interactive gallery and on the right is our 1892 Old City Hall Victorian building. It was the original city hall for the city of Bellingham. Um, and then in 1940s, early 40s, became the Whatcom Museum when the city built the new city hall. So that is our campus. Let's see if I can figure out how to. There we go. Okay. So um, I'm just going to, I don't have very many slides. I am just going to share some talking points. Um, the way that we measure visitation has changed in the last year. And so, you know, pre-COVID, we measured bodies in our buildings. So we uh, used to have about roughly 70,000 visitors a year to our campus. More than 9,000 of those would go to our family interactive gallery. And we served about 5,000 school children for field trips from kindergarten all the way to university level. We had more than 4,000 people attend our public programs in person on campus and off campus when we partnered. Um, and then we would have more than 700 people visit our photo archives to do research and um, do work searching our archives. COVID times, we measure visitation very differently now. Um, and the numbers are really dramatically different. And I'm sure you're all experiencing this, but it's really like apples to oranges. Like how can we really compare our digital engagement, which is the primary way that we're reaching a lot of our audience um, to in-person visitation? Well, the numbers obviously aren't going to be the same. And so the focus has mostly been on 
maintaining um, our audiences, keeping relationships strong with our community and our members so that they remember us <clears throat> and wanna support us when we are able to reopen. So we have in the last year, um, we've had about almost 1,700 participants to our virtual programs. Uh, we've had almost 7,000 views of 60 YouTube videos we've loaded in the last year. We've had a 38% increase in our Facebook followers since we closed um, in March of 2020. Uh, we've had almost 2,000 page views of our Fig at Home page, which is our uh, children's activities. This was a page that we did not have on our website prior to COVID, and we created it because we knew that families might have a need in art and science activities. And then we have had, I wanted to add this, a negative growth rate, um, which seems surprising, but our email uh, email list has shrunk. We have a negative growth rate on our email list. Um, however, this year we've seen an increase in our open rate and our click to open rate and more engagement. And it varies. That's the average, um, average open rate. But I, I note this because I think we're all experiencing, we're like inundated with digital stuff. Like we're all home, that's how we're engaging with organizations. And I don't know about you, but I have definitely um, unfollowed a lot of email lists I've used to follow and kind of tapped out sometimes digitally. So I, I'm not overly concerned about having lost people to me, the concern is how, how are the people who are with us engaging and are they enjoying our content and are they um, participating? And I feel like we're seeing that those who are sticking with us are really interested and engaged and want to participate. So to me, that's a positive. So I just want to talk about um, some of the things, oops, sorry. Uh, some of the things that all of us have had to do is to adapt quickly to being a digital museum. And I'm guessing many of you are from small organizations. I know Matthew, he's like running a one man show. Um, our, my, our museum actually compared to many others, we, I call it a large small museum. So we, which really just means we're like a medium sized museum. Bellingham is 90 miles north of Seattle, uh, 60 miles south of Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, so we, we have really big museums like the Seattle Art Museum and um, Museum of History and Industry in Seattle that we often compare ourselves to, but really we're in a college sized town. So our population base isn't quite as large, but as you saw, our buildings have a really big presence. People expect, uh, quality experiences from us. And we try to, to do that, but we do have a staff that we have more than a dozen full-time staff and various part-time staff. So we are pretty large compared to many small history organizations and sites that are really running on a slim, slim staffing. Uh, so I feel for you guys. So some of the adaptations that we've had to make, um, initially we're switching all of our programming to virtual. That was probably one of the easier things to switch out because it was something we knew we had all these scheduled programs. And so we just kind of jumped right into figuring out, you know, Zoom and YouTube live stream and Wirecast live stream. Then we jumped on the bandwagon of videos. And I'm sure most of you have had to experiment with that in some way or another, whether it's like simple slide videos. Um, we've done everything from gallery and curator tours to collection highlights, children's activities. Uh, we even did videos. Um, cocktail making videos for our, our fundraiser. Uh, so lots of videos. We have had to turn many of our projects um, digital. So the, the images I have on the screen on the left is a screen of a uh, laptop and that is for our digital story dome. We were supposed to launch in March of last year, a physical structure was a geodesic dome that was gonna serve as a recording booth where people coming out of our art galleries would come and record a reflection on the artwork that they saw. So we weren't able to launch that, um, but we were able to adapt that and turn it into a digital story booth on our website. And we used um, Jot Forms to help us create a form um, to record these. We have a SoundCloud 
uh, station where we post the recordings and we used it as an opportunity to get questions about um, people's experiences with COVID. So we have a nice collection of oral histories essentially or oral stories of people's experiences with COVID. So that was one example of having to shift gears and take a physical project and turn it digital. And it was bumpy, but we managed and we've got a nice uh, collection of stories. And um, the middle images of our fig at home, that's the family interactive gallery. We created a page on our website. Um, I, I wanna strongly encourage if people have, especially if you have WordPress plat as your platform for websites, it's so easy and dynamic to change it and to add pages, remove pages, shift things around. And so that has been really a big tool for helping us, I think, navigate and create projects. You know, we've created online galleries, we've created landing pages for our children's activities, for the Story Dome. And so really like keeping that website alive, updating it regularly, taking stuff out that isn't relevant is a lot of work and it can, it can be time consuming, but at the same time, it's also an easy tool to adjust. So, so we have our fig at home, which is where we put all our children's activities. And then the image on the right is just our, as a screenshot of our YouTube channel. Um, prior to COVID, we had maybe like five videos on our YouTube channel and they were all sort of like packaged marketing, what I call commercials for exhibits. Um, so now we've really, we've gotten really practiced at YouTube. We've got followers on YouTube. We didn't have that before. Um, so that's been a, a successful adaptation for us. And um, some of the things as we've adapted, and I just wanted to share one um, example of what's been a success for us, because I know one of the questions um, that we were going to discuss was uh, something that has helped us through this digital outreach um, to reach our audiences. And so we have done a little bit more with our Facebook and Instagram ad campaigns than we had done before. You know, everyone is digital now. My advertising prior to this was primarily in print and radio um, with a little bit of digital, but now people weren't picking up like the local papers, the weekly newsletters. Um, a lot of the print publications just haven't been uh, the best way to reach people. So. We have been experimenting a little bit with Facebook advertising, and that's everything from doing just a boosted post, which is great for virtual events. It's pretty simple. You can put ten buck, five dollars, ten dollars into it. Not a lot of money. You can really target your audience, and we found um, direct correlation of getting people to register for our programs. And we are using Eventbrite for program registration, which has been a great tool for us because we can track. Um, attendance, and we can also collect donations. We don't charge for most of our programs, and they are mostly free, um, but we do ask for a donation, and I've been pretty surprised at how, um, how much we've been able to raise through some of those. But anyway, we've done some uh, Facebook posts, and then we've done targeted campaigns, and so our biggest success, I, I would say, has been uh, our museum store, and the museum store this, this the gift shop has it's kind of like an add-on like a, a perk to your experience it doesn't really um it's not a big focus of like our mission it's not part of our education or exhibitions um but it's a perk of the visitor experience typically and of course we try to have products that are mission-based and that tie into our exhibitions but um it's been one of the only parts of our our campus that's been able to stay open um, because retail has been able to stay open at 25% capacity while museums, at least here in Washington, um, have not been able to be open. And because our store has a, a street front entrance, so you can enter it without having to go into the museum building, we were able to stay to remain open. So one of the things I've learned in this whole COVID and marketing is work with the things that you have already that are easiest to promote. You know, because everybody's got great ideas and we're working on projects, but those could be really challenging to promote. So we really focused this year on promoting our virtual programs and the museum store because those were really tangible 
things that were continuing. And so that's where we put a lot of this Facebook um, funding into it and time. And this year during the holidays, um, we actually holiday store sales were, I think slightly over a thousand dollars more than our holiday store sales from last year when we were actually open to the public. And I really credit that. I mean, we're not talking that we're making so much money that it's, you know, making a huge impact on our bottom line. But what I, what it does mean is that a lot of these digital campaigns that actually didn't cost us that, that much had a great return on their investment and helped our store to be um, successful during the holiday season, despite the rest of our museum campus being closed. So that's been kind of a a cool success for us, a fun surprise, a surprise. It wasn't expected. So I just, I don't have that much more to say, but I did want to give a few um, tips of what I feel like our organization has learned, or at least what I have learned from this experience. Um, one thing was I managed the marketing and public relations, and I am fortunate enough to have a digital marketing assistant that helps create these campaigns, which I know I'm sure many of you are like, jaw drop, like what? There's two of you doing marketing at your organization. I'm sure, you know, Matthew's doing all of it. He's running his organization and he's doing the marketing. Um, so I am very lucky in that regard, but something I had to step back and learn was to let other people use their strengths. You know, we often get very like compartmentalized in our departments and we're afraid to let other people step in and do a task. And so something I learned was I couldn't, I couldn't manage it all and neither could my digital marketing assistant. And I didn't have the knowledge, especially when it came to like this video work. That's just not something that I'm very comfortable with. Um, but we had educators on our staff that really liked doing that and were willing to experiment and explore and watch a million Google videos and YouTube videos to figure out how to, you know, use like Wirecast live stream. And um, we have our fig educators who are learning how to make um, little videos of craft activities and they're using their own kids and family members um, to make these videos. Uh, we're using power, PowerPoints to create virtual gallery tours that we then add sound to. You know, we'll have like the curators record their, their basically their gallery tour or talk. And we even invited our docent, our volunteer docents to um, do little collection highlights where they did audio recordings for us that we then put on top of just a static image of the artwork. So they're like just little clips or insights to a specific collection item. So we really had to get comfortable with everybody like trying things out and doing it using different tools. And we're not using very fancy tools. I mean, we're using Canva, which is like a free, you know, free online graphic program. And for those of you, if you don't know, Canva has a free nonprofit account you can sign up for, which gives you way more flexibility with what you can design. You do have to kind of go through a little prop process, fill out an application, but it's so worth it. And that has given a lot of our staff um, the ability to do easy graphics without needing like InDesign. Video Leap is a video editor for iPhones and iPads. It's pretty easy to use, um, lots of other pretty easy tools. So anyway, those are my tips. Those are kind of an overview and real quick, my last slide, if you I want to jot down any of my contact information, I welcome answering any questions anyone has or, you know, there's something that I said too quickly and you didn't quite catch it, you can send me a private chat and I'm happy to answer it. So thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, really appreciate that presentation. Um, while Matthew gets his presentation set up, I wanted to uh, communicate two questions that you got. Um, Renata Brandt was wondering what platform do you use for donations? Um, our donations are run through our website, and so uh, it just goes through the forms that we have set up on our website, and then we use like authorize.net for collecting credit card information. So it's through the, the form plugin that is on WordPress. And then um, a second question from Michael Connolly. 
Um, do you have a single Instagram account for your institution um, or do you have multiple for each aspect, the museum store, rentals, museum? We have one of all of our, our social media. So one Facebook, one Twitter, one Instagram. And even though we have multiple buildings and lots of departments, we have just tried to keep a unified brand. Um, when I first started six years ago, there were various accounts and they were really hard to manage and maintain. So we um, made the decision to just unify and try to have everybody connect us as a one museum with lots of offerings. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah. All right, Matthew, thank you're you. up next. Sorry, <laughs> you're up next. Uh, so I'd like to go ahead and screen share your presentation. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for inviting us and thank you all for attending. Um, my microphone isn't as good and I am in a rural internet area. So if I do cut out my apologies. Oh, yes, good afternoon, everyone. And good evening to the lady from Norfolk. Um, so I am Matthew Wed. I'm the executive director of the Conakajig Institute, which is a small uh, rural museum in a rural part of Pennsylvania, focused on rural low internet. And we're a 501c3 nonprofit that focuses, as Emily said, on 18th century living history. Now, in this sense, uh, when I was invited to this panel, we were very much being invited as a success story. I believe the name of the panel is Digital Outreach for Offline Something or Other. Right, Emily? Give me a nod, something like that. So it's how can you turn uh, digital social media into success offline? Um, and for us, that was definitely the core of last year. So I'm not gonna give a full overview of the site, but yes, we have several historic structures. We have 30 acres of natural resources. And in the past, our focus was on big events once a year as a fundraiser, and that's when you visit it. And of course, with COVID, uh, that is no longer an option. Um, so we had a unique opportunity uh, with COVID and 2020, and also with my hiring, I was hired during COVID, to rebuild from the ground up. Um, at the beginning of 2020, the Konica Jig Institute was virtually unknown online. Um, we had a Facebook, had a very low interaction. We did our newsletters to our members via paper, and even emails were fairly slim. And so we reinvented ourselves. And by making content online, that was relatable to a wider demographic, our engagement was greatly improved. Uh, so in that sense, COVID helped us. Uh, a lot of sites that had high foot traffic ordinarily, some took the year off last year. Um, and for us, that wasn't an option. So while they may have taken a year off, we were instantly pushing out as much digital as we could because we knew people were gonna be stuck at home looking for stuff and we were gonna fill that niche. And please just say it worked uh, pretty well. There we go. And again, my, my slow loading of photos there. And so, so part of that, what worked well was embracing the change. Uh, yes, COVID was a big thing. It changed the way we work. For living history, um, the word I use is hands-on history. And you really can't do hands-on history when you have to stay six feet away from people. Uh, but we embraced it. Uh, living historians are very proud of their historical accuracy. But even the biggest sites like Williamsburg quickly saw that if you want to do any sort of interpretation, you need to wear a mask. And so we embrace that. Plus, if you're posting COVID pictures without masks uh, mid last year, uh, you can get into trouble for that. So embrace the change in that sense. Uh, the other sense is embrace the change in everything. Um, I am younger than our last manager and we've changed our demographic. Uh, to be aiming for families. We've embraced that change and it, that's paid off as well. Because people couldn't go inside the museums for most of the year here, we do have a 30 acre site. So we made our programming outdoors. We encouraged self-guided learning for interactive packs. Um, so yeah, really embracing that change helped. Uh, all of these photos here are actually from public events we had last year uh, that were well attended, but under the limit and they were all free. Uh, we didn't feel that by having our museum doors closed, we could legitimately ask people to pay to come to an event. So we had free events and people really respected that. And our memberships and our donations were improved as a result. People remember what you do during hard times. 
to offering a family a safe place to come outside and enjoy without having to worry about being enclosed. Uh, people really respect that. Now our Facebook has grown um, for a number of reasons and they have some graphs, uh, but we did notice some consistent success themes. Uh, first off, since being hired in June of 2020, the Khan Academy Institute has posted every day um, and people are staying tuned. So stay consistent is a major part of that. I have to say, Christina, I'm not completely alone. Um, I do have a fairly good volunteer base and board and I do have a volunteer social media coordinator. It's called my wife. Uh, I come up the posts, she makes them better and she's here as well. Uh, so one of the consistent success themes was to ask for help. Um, people love to be validated in their own knowledge. And this came up by mistake, actually. Uh, one day a member had asked me, emailed me personally, what is this pot? And I did not have time to do some pot research. So I just posted it quickly to Facebook. It was one of our most popular posts in that month. Everyone's like, I've got that pot. My grandmother had that pot. Oh yes, that's a good pot. So ask people for help if they're more likely to feel like they're offering something, they're more likely to comment it and share it with their friends. And so yeah, make people feel validated. Uh, another thing is make your visit at the start. Um, obviously it's hard to get people into closed areas but if you can post and you have permission to post someone's photograph and name, tag them. Because for that one post, uh, that member, that, that volunteer visitor, in this case, her name is Annie, she's going to share that with her entire family for certain. And they're going to share it. And that's going to reach a wider network of people who haven't seen your site than if you just did a random factoid. Uh, dogs are cute. Uh, that's just a given. So we try and feature uh, animals as much as possible. In this case, mine, because I like walking my site. Um, and the fourth consistent success theme is that children are the key. Uh, we've seen a massive spike in mother aged families on our Facebook, uh, away from the kind of slightly older family. And this goes more of the make your visit the star. If you make the children a star, now you've got that child's parents, their grandparents, their aunts, their uncles, their second cousins, they're all going to like that post. And so you've now got a much higher post, which now the next day when you post about your capital campaign, those people are more likely to see it on their feed. So yeah, make people uh, the star for certain. There were some negatives um, and part of that is adapting to them. So this is cut your losses and don't give up. And the young lady there is holding a knife and that's why I use that photo, cut your losses. Uh, she wasn't the loss. Um, so yeah, not everything has worked. Follow your audience numbers and adjust your strategy as necessary. And don't be defeated by it. A uh, good example, I love trivia nights. Uh, so we started doing trivia Thursday and it had a lot of comments for a while, which was great. But then we realized it was the same people every week and it wasn't a part of our entire network. It was really just a few people. And so it wasn't doing justice to our full group. So we phased it out. Also, in terms of time and planning, constantly contacting the people who won trivia to give them the opportunity for another question. It was a lot of time, so it's taking away from other resources. So when you have a small staff, time and planning versus results are a big thing. Uh, the same is true of some of the bigger posts, like videos. If you're going to spend hours researching, preparing, filming, and editing a video, you want to make sure it's going to be worth it. Um, there are times when a five second coffee post has done better than a post that took all day to repair. So definitely weigh the time and planning a social media post takes compared to the results you're going to get. And the last one is, I think my biggest fault is to reward interaction. If someone comments or offers good information or asks a question, take the time to respond. Um, I describe myself in this sense, I'm like an archer. I loose an arrow and my eyes are already moving on to the next. Uh, in this case, I posted this morning at 9 a.m. I was already thinking about my 2, 2 p.m. post. Uh, and so, yeah, I need to get better staying on touch with people who are commenting. Because again, if they ask a question and it's not answered, they're probably less likely to comment and share next time. And your numbers are going to fall because of it. So, yeah, reward interaction. Reward your visitor for the time they're giving in interacting with your page. 
it's a little bit, bit hard to see because I'm on a very high, uh, high gamma screen here. Uh, but these are some of the back end metrics from our Facebook. Um, and I hope you can see uh, some pretty big changes. If you look at the bottom left, we currently have 2,197 followers. For the whole of 2019, we had just more than 1,000. There was a spike during an event, which was a, a major event, and it plateaued for the whole of 2020 until I was hired. I was actually measuring this the other day with what we were posting, and there was a spike after I was hired because I increased our personal network. But then in July, August, we've just gone straight up and not stopped. And I said, what happened in July, August? Because I was hired in May, June. It's when we started doing our good videos, our virtual programs. Starting June and July, we posted a virtual program every week. And we kind of stopped doing it weekly in November and December because uh, it got tiring. But it's been a consistent uh, rise. Um, our best video, which is top right hand corner there, it was a woman's role video. Uh, it reached just close to 13,000 people, and that's just on Facebook. It had more on YouTube. That video, we actually filmed all the stock footage during an outdoor event. The voiceover was done at home. Um, there was maybe two hours of editing. Uh, but that video, for its interest level, was shared in other museum groups. And again, then those people started following us. Uh, so it's really great right now when we do do a post to see some of our people from we have a sutler from seattle who follows us he's our top fan now a year ago he wouldn't have known about ci top left hand corner is what's doing well for us and obviously you can see videos is the best average video making 1300 uh status and photos next what's interesting is what's on the bottom of that list is shared video um, occasionally, when I don't have time to record a video during a week, I'll share another organization's video. And sometimes it's a really good video, but the engagement is tiny. And from what I'm seeing, what I'm encountering people is like, well, if they wanted to watch that person's video, they would have gone to their site. Um, so we'll continue to share videos uh, as fill up for me and also to help encourage our community partnerships. Uh, but yeah, you do see people won't. They don't want to watch someone else's video on your site when they can watch it elsewhere. Um, and Christina mentioned uh, boosting. Um, we are a small nonprofit and I am frugal by nature. And I was also new to social media. And so the entire time we've been here, that bottom right hand graph there, you see our spikes. I only boosted one post since starting uh, and actually didn't do as good as the others. We were trying to boost an event. What I like to call it is organic boosting which is free. So I know I've got a video coming up next weekend and I put a lot of effort into it. I know that our weakest demographic is young people. So I will text all of the young people I know and I'll say Sunday morning, you need to get on right now and comment for me. And they'll be like, why? I'm like, just, just do it. Just say this was a neat thing. So is it cheating a little bit? Yes. But now that video has got a head start. It's now being shared in a local LARPing group that wouldn't have been shared in. Uh, it now has several comments already. When people see the post, they say, oh, someone's commented. I'm gonna see who commented. Uh, so yeah, organic boosting, it's not cheating. It's just giving yourself a wee bit of an advantage. Um, I don't know what that huge spike was in September. Well, actually, it, was, it, could have, it could have been the woman's video, but yeah. Some very odd big spikes there for those uh, metrics. I don't think this is going to work. Uh, oh, here we go again. I'm in rural, rural internet. I'm not going to play an entire video uh, because it might blow up my internet. But I'm going to have it playing. I'm going to talk about what made our videos somewhat of a success in the background. So I need to get rid of that. And I'm going to skip about halfway. Nope, it's not going to let me. Because if I hover down, Gotcha. We're gonna go, we're gonna hit. So our videos, we started off doing videos that were simple, uh, just lectures, literally head boxes. Uh, there's a wonderful free software called Filmora Wondershare. And Filmora Wondershare, I've killed my computer. 
<laughs> before I wanted to share is a really good editing software uh, that uh, you can uh, make these videos. This video was done with just me talking to myself, but we made it seem like it's his own thing. There we go. So we're, I'm not going to skip past this. If you want to see our YouTube videos, go to our YouTube, go to our Facebook. And if you want advice on how we made some of these, uh, please, you can contact us and they will give you my contact information. Again, it's a learning process. The video quality has increased exponentially. And I am certainly, uh, there's part of me that wants to take off July's videos of last year, because they seem amateur hour in uh, comparison. Uh, but it's all part of that growth. People can see you're improving. Now, I will say videos are free, but it doesn't mean they're not going to get engagement and also donations. Uh, we've seen a lot of people donate that said, great video. In this case, they said it was Monty Python-esque. Um, and when we try and theme our videos around things that people can access for free, like the outdoor resources, it makes them come onto site. And then that's when you get the donations and the memberships. Yeah, so being a uh, host for my screen sharing, whenever I try to go down to where the mic was to mute that guy, me, uh, that thing would come up. So never mind. My final thing uh, about social media success is to use an historical term, join or die, or in friendlier terms, stronger together, uh, community collaborations. Social media is free. And so it doesn't need to be a competition. Uh, the more people viewing and sharing your content, the better. And so don't fight over scraps. Uh, we've greatly increased the number of partners we're working with. And so, for example, with one of these, the National Museum of Civil Medicine, we filmed a video together. They are a bigger organization than us. They have a very expensive $1,000 camera. I have an English accent an outdoor site, and I have some editing skills. So we joined together, we filmed a video, and then we both jointly post it on our site. Theirs is gonna reach more, we bring what we can. Um, and so we both benefit from that relationship. Uh, in the same sense that if I see another organization that's doing a good event, I'm gonna post their events because I want people to succeed. I want people encouraging tourism in this area and I hope that those other organizations will help host and share ours. So yeah, it's not a competition. Help each other uh, and you'll be stronger for it. Um, and definitely, definitely, definitely tag people uh, these other organizations. Um, you, you want people to be noting that you are trying to help them out. It's a lot to manage. Uh, it's a lot to follow up on, uh, but it really does pay dividends because now the National Museum of Civil War Medicine Museum knows about Connacht Jig Institute. Uh, through them, Emily knew about the Connacht Jig Institute. Uh, for them now, Christina knows about the Connacht Jig Institute. And for all of this, now 30 odd of you know about the Connacht Jig Institute. So yeah, spread that word and spread that name and your donations and membership will count for it. When Emily invited us to be on this panel, I made the joke that I would take the underdog story of a uh, someone this that survived something bad. And Emily said in nonprofits, we're all the underdog, uh, which is definitely true. We're all, we have to fight the good fight. Uh, but yeah, I'll definitely say that the, these things don't have to be a bad thing. There's always something you can pull out, a silver lining as it were. But yeah, I planned on being longer, Emily, but part of that was gonna be the fact that I was doing hilarious things in the background in that video. I wore several clothes. I was dressed as a woman at one point. Uh, but alas, if you want to see those amazing things, go to our YouTube, Colonial Living at the Conic and Jig Institute. And I believe that it, that is up. So stop share. There we go. Thank you so much for that, Matthew. That was a great presentation. Um, we'll be sure to include a direct link to that particular video so that you can watch it at your leisure in our um, follow-up communication after this. Um, we got some really great questions in the chat, um, and we are going to address those, but I think first I'm going to ask Jake Wynn to set up his presentation, um, and we will address those questions um, in the Q&A section at the end. So I'll be sure to bring that, that particular question up. Thank you, Melissa Hawker. All right, can everybody see that and hear me? Good, good. All right, great. Um, 
Well, I want to, uh, my name is Jake Wynn. I am uh, Director of Interpretation at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick. Uh, thank you to Emily for pulling this all together and uh, to my fellow uh, members of the panel. It's been a delight to, uh, to get to chat with them and kind of talk about pulling this all together over the last couple of weeks um, and to learn more about their institutions as well. And thank you out there to all of you viewing today. Um, a little bit about my uh, institution. Um, Emily did mention this at the intro, but just to reiterate, um, our museum uh, is located, the, the Civil War Medicine Museum is located in Frederick, Maryland, uh, at the heart of the Civil War uh, in, in Maryland. Um, we also operate two separate sites as well. The Pry House Field Hospital Museum on the right is at Antietam National Battlefield, and where I am currently um, is the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum in Washington, D.C., in downtown D.C., um, and this is where typically uh, you'll find me most of the week. Um, so these museums have, by and large, uh, been either closed or had kind of uh, trying to abide by public health restrictions over the last year, uh, doing tours by appointment. It's been very much in flux as for most of you will have experienced that same kind of situation. Uh, so we have really had to resort uh, to, to, the, uh, to this digital side that we have all learned how to do over the past year. Um, all hopefully have improved uh, at least a little bit. I know that we have uh, improved slightly in, in some regards in terms of our, our digital strategy um, and what we've done. Um, and uh, we've found some success. I'll talk a little bit about those. We've also found some challenges. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on that as well. I'll, I'll try to keep my remarks pretty brief here because I know we want to get to some great questions from, from all of you um, at the end of the program. Uh, but we were, as an institution, kind of uniquely placed. Um, we are very fortunate, and I know that um, there are plenty of museums out there across America and the world that fo are focused on medical history. Uh, we, of course, uh, focus on the Civil War era in regards to medicine, which there's lots of myths and misconceptions out there about Civil War medicine, which unfortunately we can't get into today, but highly encourage you to go to our website and learn more about that uh, if you, if you want to learn more, Civil War Med. Org. Uh, this is our uh, mission uh, statement, um, as well as a vision statement. Um, both of these things were amended in 2018 as part of a uh, strategic planning process. Um, and I focused on this because uh, the, the first vision statement here, uh, because of this line here, inspire the public by connecting the lessons of the past to challenges in the world today. Uh, and so this has been really our driving force in 2020 and 2021 is to talk about Civil War medicine and 19th century medical care in the context of our own global health crisis. Um, so we came up with this term uh, in March of last year, shortly after we closed to the public, uh, of something called hope through history. Uh, and this has been it's something that we've done multiple programs online in regards to this. Uh, we've made it a part of our of our interpretation, both at the museum uh, for when we were open to the public and in the online programming side. This idea of connecting the past to the present and showing uh, relevancy of Civil War medical care to say, yep, we have these views of Civil War medicine. Uh, they're largely uh, incorrect, as it turns out, um, our modern view of that uh, kind of mainstream world. Thank you, Hollywood. Um, but we can actually learn a lot um, by looking at how uh, through historical thinking, how these uh, leaders during the 19th century thought about medicine, how they made changes to their world that still impact our world today. Um, so that's been a driving force uh, for us through this, uh, through the pandemic and through this, this terrible situation that we've all gone through. Now, as part of that, uh, I think we need to go back a little bit further. Uh, I started at the museum in 2015 the museum had social media accounts um, across the board. We had a Facebook page, we had a Twitter account, we had Instagram uh, as well. Um, and we had a, a, a smallish following for all of those. I, I do think it's interesting with the Twitter account uh, was in the name of our executive director. So it was our handle, um, Civil War Med, uh, where you can still find us today, but uh, the name on the account was George Wonderlich. So it was his personal account. Um, so one of the first things that I did in partnership with some of the other edu great educators uh, and kind of marketing uh, folks that we had at the museum is to, to make social media a, an emphasis 
for the museum. So when we got to the pandemic and we had to go to this online virtual format, uh, this is something that we were able to kind of work into strategies that we already had to think of social media, not just as a marketing tool, but also as an educational tool as well, um, to, to use stories from our collection, use artifacts from our collection, uh, use pieces of our, of our exhibits that we have on, on display to, to bring them to a virtual uh, audience to share um, and to encourage others to share their own histories as well, to, to comment or uh, put posts on our wall or tag us online. Uh, we very much believed that this, uh, this new online world that we all inhabit and spend a scary amount of time every day on um, can be used for good um, and can be used to, to uh, teach people about the museum, about our mission, about Civil War medicine. Um, and so the pandemic, as it took place and, and became increasingly a disaster for, for all of us, and especially in the museum world, um, a, a real nightmare, this idea became more and more important to us of making sure we're using these tools that we have online to share these stories. And one of the most important ways that we've been doing this uh, and has evolved pretty rapidly over the, over the course of this year is the use of video. Um, I know we've already talked about that today with, my other, um, with the other members of the panel, uh, but video is crucial. Um, and we have found uh, in increased success uh, in how far our videos, our, our posts will go um, on Facebook, uh, on YouTube as well. I'll talk about YouTube in just a, in just a sec. Um, but these videos have been crucial to our growth in reach and also our growth in following. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had about 22,000 followers on uh, Facebook. Uh, that number has since now gone up to about 31,000. So we've seen a, a significant increase there in part, and I don't have a chart, a nice nifty chart like uh, Matt had, um, but it's the same kind of thing. Videos are where people uh, and where Facebook is really pushing uh, pages like all of ours to go. Um, and it's all about the algorithm, right? So it, you really if you're contemplating using social media more often, highly recommend using their insights that Facebook uh, makes available to you. I think this is a great thing across the board to look at Twitter, Instagram, wherever you are, to look at those analytics and try to um, learn a little bit more about that data because that's gonna help you make informed decisions about uh, what kind of content you're gonna put out there. Um, so instead of just kind of throwing stuff against the wall to see what sticks, you have the tools, the tools are made available to you um, with a little bit of um, you know, research, a little, little bit of learning about the back end of, of these sites, you can really uh, start to improve how far your posts will go, how many people are engaging with your posts. And I will reiterate what has already been said that uh, making it a, a conversation as opposed to just, uh, you know, you put stuff out there and uh, people interact with it and you never say anything back to them, it's important to have that conversation. And I want to mention that specifically with this photo, I have a screenshot of a video that we uh, posted earlier this week, a conversation, and this is one of the things I love about um, this, this virtual world that we all inhabit now is we did a live program with Dr. Catherine Bateson uh, and she's in the UK. And so we did a live conversation with her about music and Civil War medicine. Um, and we could use uh, the, the Facebook Live uh, ability, the, this tool that we have to have this conversation uh, and to allow others to come into the conversation. So on the right side of the screen over here, the comments section, um, we are interacting with people in the comments. And that has been a really important tool for us uh, to interact with these viewers, encourage them to share where they're watching from. And we've learned as a result of that, that we have folks watching from around the country as well as uh, from across the world. Um, so that has been a, a great way of getting to know people in a weird way through the comments section, um, interacting and actually getting to know people. And you see similar names popping up and you can interact with them. And it gives people uh, really the, this kind of authenticity to the programming. You're, you're we are putting ourselves out there and introducing ourselves and our personalities. I think one of our best speakers, uh, one of our best interviewers is John Lustria, who's here on the screen, um, does a, an amazing job of both interacting with the, the comment section and with the guests. So we're very fortunate in that regard. And I know John's here uh, in the, in the uh, Zoom with us today. So sing his praises. Um, 
But uh, another element of this that's really important is, uh, and where we found a lot of success with these videos, uh, comes from talking about membership. Um, talking about how people watching these videos, uh, which are made available for free online, how they can support more programs like this and support our institution. Um, so from the very beginning, uh, we were thinking about how we wanted to do kind of fundraising out of, out of these videos. How can we make this worth our while? And the way that we came around, uh, came around to and kind of deciding is uh, we kind of all listen to NPR um, and listen to public radio. And so, you know, during fundraising months, uh, fundraising weeks, you hear these pitches. And so we kind of picked up on that and added those into our videos at the beginning, the middle-ish, and in the end of the video, these pitches for if you like this program, you can directly support it. And then adding in uh, membership links into the, into the chat. Um, has been very, very helpful, encouraging people to sign up, become a member, support these videos, support the museum, and then also importantly, to give them a shout out when they do that. So when we see those memberships come in during a program, you know, thank them, thank those folks for, for giving up their money at, and their time uh, to, to support these videos, support this content, and, uh, and support the institution. Their, their praises should be sung as well. Another note on this, just because I have a link here, um, is a big focus for us at the museum now is to um, kind of cross, uh, cross post um, between different, uh, different mediums. So uh, a post on Twitter uh, that will encourage people to go and look at something that may have a bit more length to it on Facebook links to your website and your blog, um, photos from your collection. Um, you want to use multiple mediums because the, the uh, algorithms on your social media networks are going to, uh, they're gonna in the end be better for you uh, if you are posting a variety of different kinds of content and going to sending links to different places. Uh, another element to that is uh, to think of yourself a little bit like the, and I, Matt mentioned this as well, think of yourself a little bit like the, uh, the Santa Claus from uh, Miracle on 34th Street, if you've seen that film. Um, if you don't have something that uh, you, you know, somebody else is putting out some great content, it's perfectly fine to share that content to your followers and to share that. That partnership is gonna be really, really important. So this here is um, the same video, but we put it up on YouTube. Um, YouTube's been a big area of focus for us as well, um, trying to increase the following there. Um, it is, I believe, our lowest um, in terms of follower count um, on, uh, of all the social networks. Um, and so we're trying to raise that up uh, in part because uh, YouTube does allow you to monetize after you reach a certain point. Um, so this is an area we don't really know. Um, we're, we're trying to experiment with different ideas of trying how to grow that YouTube account, posting consistently, doing live streams on YouTube in addition to on Facebook. Um, but this is something that is kind of new to us. We're learning um, and it's a process that we don't have a tried and true method yet to know what is going to work and what's not going to work. What we do find that works, uh, and we have some experience on this on YouTube, is partnering with other organizations. And that has already been mentioned, um, sharing each other's audiences, sharing stories. It's a great way to, uh, to introduce new audiences to you and uh, for other institutions, um, you know, for you to introduce your audience um, to other institutions. It's a great way of, of working together. Um, doesn't really cost anything other than a little bit of time to work out what those programs or those videos are gonna look like and how that partnership will work. And then finally, just um, you know, some some uh, little things that we've learned, um, and uh, you know, take advantage of the uh, of the partnerships, the 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 people you know. Um, be authentic. Um, it's a weird thing to say, but be yourself. Um, and whether that's you as an individual, or um, if you can cultivate an institutional voice, uh, it's very very helpful. You want people to get to know you. That's one of the things about social media um, that is incredible: is that you can you can put yourself out there, um, and you can uh, share who you are, what interests you, uh, and your organization, who your organization is, um, who are some of the players that are involved. It's a great way of giving people a behind the scenes uh, look at what you do and also is going to, uh, to get people interested in, in wanting to support you as well. Uh, and another thing on the right here, uh, our most popular tweet ever on Twitter with Bernie Sanders, um, 
I took literally five minutes to edit this photo and put it up and it was the most popular tweet we had ever done. Uh, it is endlessly infuriating to me. Um, but it's a good point that Matt made as well that uh, you can put lots of time and effort into posts on social media and inevitably the ones that you will put the most effort into will be the ones that eh, they're okay but it's the thing that you put literally five minutes or ten minutes of effort into that inevitably sometimes will uh will will be the popular post so it's good it's a good thing to if you have a, a quick idea that comes to mind of like oh our followers might enjoy this go ahead and share it um, it, it is okay to just, you know, it's good to have a schedule and, and consistency, uh, but when there's an opportunity that shows up, uh, take advantage of those opportunities because oftentimes those are going to be uh, where you can find success and find new audiences. And you might wonder what the heck does Bernie Sanders have to do with Civil War medicine? Uh, but it's a great way to say, this is a photograph of Civil War surgeons at Petersburg, Virginia in 1864. And we also gained about 40 new followers on Twitter as a result of this. And now they're going to see all of the other posts that we're putting up. So it's a good opportunity um, when these kinds of things pop up a viral moment, if you will, uh, to be able to, uh, to, to share in that uh, and be a part of this larger conversation. So that's, uh, that's it for me. Um, thank you again, Emily, for the opportunity to be here, um, be part of the panel. And thank you all out there for, uh, for being with us today. Thank you, Jake. Thanks for that great presentation. Um, during your presentation, we got an excellent question from Melissa Hawker asking whether you have experienced any attacks on your live videos. Um, she's saying that they've had some issues with this over what has been seen as contested history lately. Uh, yes, that is a great question and the dangers of doing things live. Um, we have uh, actually not had too much of an issue of, of a of attacks um, and, and things getting particularly ugly. I've actually been rather surprised because we do talk about Civil War history, and we're talking, you know, unabashedly talking about issues around race um, and talking about issues around medicine um, is and, and COVID, um, because that's been a part of our programming as well. Um, we've been fortunate. Um, what I will say is it's really great to have, um, you know, it, it might be more difficult for a smaller staff, but if you can manage it, to have someone on the uh, on the back end moderating the comment section, um, to do this, to tag team, um, so that if things get ugly, you can have someone there to back you up. So you're not trying to host a video and deal with a live um, and nasty comment section. We've all seen internet comment sections. Um, the issue that we've actually had the biggest problem with and we've had to figure out how to manage it is spam. Um, spam comments. Um, we tapped into some network. I don't know where, it, when it happened, where it happened, but um, of uh, basically sending out mass phishing links um, into our comment section. Um, so moderating that has actually been our biggest issue. Um, in some parts uh, on the video, the back end of Facebook does give you the ability to actually restrict uh, certain kinds of comments. Um, and if that doesn't work and you have a problematic, we've been going to the ban button um, when we need to do that. Um, but it's good to, we found it's good to have somebody who can share links in the comment section, interact with people in the comment section, and also help to moderate that discussion. So if you can manage two people on a stream, one person on camera, one person doing some of the back end logistics side, that's the way that we've uh, been able to find success in dealing with those kinds of situations. Thank you, Jake. Um, so I want to make note that it's two o'clock now, actually 2.02. So we have taken up our hour, but I think we have a few more questions that folks would probably like if we address. Um, and I think there's a little more of this conversation to be had. And so if you have to go, it is two, but we're going to continue to record um, and keep up the conversation for at least a little bit longer while questions are coming in. Um, just to continue to jump off of that question, Jake, I wanted to follow up to ask you and the other um, panelists, um, how does your organization and social media stay relevant? Um, and particularly since relevance right now, having lived through a year that has included political unrest, um, that's included mass racial justice movements and other national flashpoints that are huge on social media, um, how do you address those things in the context of your mission? and? Um, and is there anything else you want to share about that, about your treatment of it internally and also externally? I can respond a little to that. Um, we have been really, when it comes to virtual programming, we've been pretty intentional about um, 
our time being more restricted in these new formats, just because we've had, we have had some staff cuts, we have had to do more with less. So um, we've partnered with like, we partnered with the League of Women Voters. Um, civics is a big focus of our mission, history and civics. And so we have done a lot of programming around that. And so what we've done in addition in our social media is try to share curated content, meaning we look for articles, we look for other organizations in our community that we can share, um, and we tie it back to what we're doing. So like if we have a speaker that's talking about, you know, um, voting issues or anger and politics, then if we find other related articles, we might share them. Um, we try to also just be really sensitive to what's happening, um, not just nationally, but in our own community. Uh, indig indigenous issues are really big here in the Pacific Northwest. So we tend, and, and that's a really big initiative for us is bringing in the indigenous voices. So we've been trying to share like indigenous podcasts and artists who are doing um, some really interesting works um, and so we try to be flexible. So we, we just kind of balance between what do we have to promote this week that's happening with what are the bigger topics that tie to our mission that we're trying to move forward. And that's where sometimes the curated content or the sharing is really um, helpful. I'll, I'll add in, um, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Matt. I was just going to say, um, because our, our site is growing, we have so much change. Our role is to present the facts as it pertains to our mission. Um, and like Jake, we have a medical uh, exhibit here by Institute Medicine. And so there are going to be opinions on everything, um, but our job is just to talk about the facts. So I will talk about how in 18th century medicine, people promoted false cures. Um, I'm not going to talk about how any modern people would talk about false cures in terms of COVID, but that's, I'm talking about my subject alone. Um, with those issues, Emily, I stay neutral. Um, I promote the facts as to our culture and our mission, um, but yeah, neutral is best. Uh, it's not best. Neutral is safest. How about that? Um, I'll say we have a safe place to visit, no matter what your beliefs are. Um, but yeah, stay neutral. Offend no one. So we've taken, um, you know, because we have an institution and I, I live here in, in DC, um, it's been, it's events of the last year have been very in, in our face. Um, it's been very much an issue right here where we are. Um, we've been, our, we've been willing to have these, very willing as an institution to have these kinds of difficult conversations at kind of the confluence of, uh, of race, of medicine, uh, we are are very much about having those kinds of conversations, as messy as they can be, um, especially in an online setting. That's been something that we've had to had to deal with a lot this year. That hadn't been as big of an issue in the past is how to deal with uh, racist comments, um, people trying to hijack comment sections uh, for for partisan ends. Um, how to deal with that um, and uh, it, it is good that to have a kind of, uh, we have this on our website, I, I use it when things get real ugly, um, is when we have, a, we have a social media kind of like standards, uh, basically what we uphold if you engage with us in a digital format, we uphold you to this set of standards. Um, and basically to be kind, be understanding, listen to others, uh, engage in good faith arguments, um, and if things get ugly, I oftentimes will wield that out, slap it down. And if people continue on, I'll just delete um, content that is um, outside of those kinds of standards. Uh, it is difficult um, to, to uh, and I think this is actually something for, for those of us who are doing social media, it never ends. Um, we are engaged in these conversations all the time. Um, we're working with, uh, the public 
and it's not just nine to five. It's not just five days a week. It is all the time and it can be exhausting. And I know that I was exhausted at numerous occasions throughout 2020, um, but, but I think it's important to, to recognize how much of our civic conversation goes on online right now. Um, and as best as an institution as you can to encourage good faith conversation, good faith argument, uh, evidence-based um, conversation as well to encourage people to share links that aren't to, uh, again, partisan websites. Um, these are, are good ways of fostering um, conversation that I very strongly believe in can actually move the needle, um, but you need to be able to moderate it. And that's, that's something that we have learned the importance of over, over this year. Thank you. Um, I have another question from the chat from Ann Wilson. Um, this is a very different subject, but I think all three of you will probably have different answers. Um, she's curious about allocating dollars and creating a budget for social media advertising. Um, do you have a certain percentage of the marketing budget that's dedicated to it, or do you use a different strategy? So for the uh, Museum of Civil War Medicine, uh, most of our, our social media content um, over these past couple of years, not just, not just this year, um, has largely been focused on organic, um, organic growth. Um, again, kind of some of the things that Matt mentioned as well um, about uh, organically boosting, um, finding ways and strategies to encourage people to interact with posts. Um, using the algorithm, um, trying to figure out ways that you can uh, use it to your advantage. Um, a lot of that is trial and error. Uh, and also you can Google, um, there's lots of so-called experts out there that actually do have some, some knowledge that can be a, of assistance. Um, but uh, most of our, our kind of online digital marketing has been focused um, uh, elsewhere, not on social media, more so of trying to drive traffic to our website, um, placing ads elsewhere. Um, so, so social media, we, we've done it for a few events in the past and not had a lot of success. So we focus at least on the, uh, on the organic side and social media. I can comment to that. Um, I do, I manage our advertising budget. And this year I decided to allocate um, a much greater portion to digital advertising. So I have 20% of my entire advertising budget is going to digital. Um, and that is um, both on Facebook and Instagram, but also um, digital packages that you can do through like your newspaper, you know, a newspaper or another company that manages digital advertising where they're doing all the targeting work and you're just providing the content. Um, but we just felt like last year, the little bit we were experimenting with both of those was really successful in giving us metrics that our print ads were just not able to give us. And so I am just slowly shifting our budget and I'm going to track and see, you know, what that brings in for us. But I do think it's important, you know, if you, that you put a little bit aside, even if you just decide this year, we're going to do 1% or 5% and we're just going to focus on Facebook or we're going to do one digital campaign with the newspaper for our fundraiser. Um, Cause it will give you some metrics that are really helpful. Thanks. And I've spent nothing, but we probably will in the future. Great, thank you. Um, I think we're probably gonna take 10 more minutes uh, for questions. Um, I wanted to go back to a question that Melissa Hawker had for you, Matthew, um, but I think there's a follow-up that will probably be applicable to everybody. Um, she was wondering about uh, the packs that you mentioned making. Um, she wanted you to share a bit more about what went into them um, and then what worked and what you would not include again. Oh, okay. Um, so we're talking about the activity packs we have for people to do for self-guided learning. Was that what we're talking about? Um, so yeah, it was just one of the first things to do. We didn't have many people coming to the site on their own because we have some great historic buildings and some nature trails, but if you had kids and you were suddenly homeschooling for the first time, you wanted them to be engaged. Um, so I made up a little children's activity pack that was just an explorer pack and a link to the parts of our site. And I made them available for free by, this was proper COVID lockdown when you couldn't be close to someone. Um, we put a box 
on the outside wall of that building. Uh, we print them off here. I even got some coloring pencils donated. I put them in another box outside the building. So it was zero, zero personnel contact, but people came to do these packs alone. Uh, and that's kept them coming when we then have, like I said, events. So yes, the, the activity packs were a free resource that brought people to the site and then makes them come back. Um, as for what did work in them, part of it is if you have self-guided learning, make sure everything's always going to be available. Uh, so for example, some of them are pertaining to different seasons and you could find what you're looking for. So yeah, make sure if it's self-guided, the, the guide can self-guide themselves. And then to follow up on things that did work and things that don't work, um, I was wondering if any of you had um, examples of lessons learned that you would not do again um, during you know, your experience managing social media during the pandemic. What was sort of a waste of time that you would recommend folks don't do if they hear about it? I mean, it, it was in my, in my slides, obviously, but something that involves relying on a digital user. Uh, our Trivia Thursday was an example of that. Whoever won trivia had to provide the trivia for the next week. And for some time after that, they might be checked out. So I would send a reminder email. Do you have a question for next week? Do you have a question for next week? And in a day off, they're like, oh, I forgot. Can you make one up? And so <laughs> that's three messages I've sent now. And I still have to do a trivia on the spot. So yeah. If, one thing I'd try and avoid is trying to rely on someone else if you don't have a backup. Um, I think uh, it's it's kind of a, a little things. Um, you know, we we consistency is something that I think is really really important. Um, don't uh, one of the lessons we learned early on is that we were trying to make too much content. Like we had so many great ideas, some of them weren't so great, um, that uh, we were trying to trying to do too much. And there was a burnout element um, that became a big issue. And as I mentioned earlier, like the, the, especially the social media digital engagement stuff never really turns off. Um, it's always kind of there. And so that the potential for burnout in regards to doing this kind of digital side uh, work is real um, and so uh, reining yourself in um, with those all those good ideas uh, finding and in, the importance of also knowing that uh, for us at least we're going to continue these virtual programs and this this digital strategy is going to go long beyond the pandemic um, and understanding that it's okay to spread out these ideas over a long period of time and not try to do four videos in a week um so those kind those are the kinds of lessons that uh that that i've taken to heart uh from from this year yeah i want to echo jake that similarly in the beginning we were so full of ideas and then we quickly found ourselves overwhelmed and for me and my assistant um we went from having every single department suddenly be so excited about us because we were the the way that they could get their content the educators weren't engaging with students in the, the exhibit rooms anymore now they need to do it digitally and we're the holders of the, those tools so um we had to put some real uh bumpers down for the rest of our staff and set expectations because um we just weren't going to work ourselves to the ground. It was impossible. Um, so we've just found some things just don't work. And um, I think the hardest part for me in the marketing and PR role is I feel like uh, people look at me as the measure of success or failure. And I try to remind them that there's many factors. You know, it's not just whether we got it out to the right audience? Did it get out enough times on social media? Did we put enough money into it? But sometimes people just aren't interested and we can't even really understand the factors behind that. And so it's been really a lot of work to keep expectations um, 
in check with our staff. And I think we've, we're getting comfortable with that now, but like the first few months of the pandemic, I just felt such stress because everybody was like, why isn't my program working or uh, getting out there? So anyway, no, no big flops, no, nothing that we were like, oh, that was so awful, <laughs> thankfully. Thank you. Um, all right, well, I think we're wrapping up. Um, I do have one concrete sort of numbers question for Jake from Liz Chateau. Um, she was just wondering if you have um, any specific numbers on those membership, that membership growth that you mentioned. Yeah, so I didn't actually have it for this. I had kind of uh, the, the basics. So I messaged our, uh, our membership guy, uh, Kyle, and asked him and, uh, so we uh, it, just new memberships from 2019 to 2020, we saw an 88% increase in new memberships um, this, this past year in 2020. So, um, and we're on track right now um, to, to hopefully beat that, um, you know, to, to continue that growth um, this year. So it's, it's been um, Weirdly, it's it's exciting. I think that that model of doing the kind of like viewing it as this like NPR, like you viewer out there support this content um, and you're making our technology better and our videos better and, and it, the videos do reflect that they, they look better, they sound better. We are better at being interviewers. Uh, we've learned a lot of lessons, and um, yeah, we just we're we're putting ourselves out there. We're introducing ourselves and our personality, and we're also interacting with these folks in the comments section. Uh, then they're calling the museum when they become a member. They're getting their materials from the museum, and it becomes very much this relationship that started uh, from you know a video on Facebook or YouTube. It's it's been pretty pretty impactful um, for us. Uh, I will say I've watched a lot of YouTube videos over the last year and gone and seen how YouTubers, people who may not be doing anything related to, mu to museum work, how they are interacting with their audiences and trying to apply some of the lessons learned from, you know, the, the 19 or 20 year old on YouTube or Twitch. Um, how are they interacting with, their, with, with the people who are supporting their content and trying to apply some of those lessons into what we do as well. Thank you, Jake. All right, so I think this is the final call for any final question or statement from panelists. Um, the panelists have given us all permission, um, given me permission to include their contact information in uh, the follow-up. And so if you'd like to reach out to anybody, they are available. Um, thank you so much to everybody who is stuck with us till the end. Um, thank you for your excellent questions. Um, we'll be in touch with resources, probably a survey, um, other information that was mentioned in today's uh, presentation. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, have a great weekend. I'm going to record Thanks, a video Emily. about Spanish ladies. <laughs> it's a song. It's a song. We'll be sure to check it out. <laughs>